It's Labor Day weekend, and so this message that I want to give this morning, I want it to be one of encouragement and one of refreshing and one of hope. And, you know, last week, one of the songs they sang was Praise, Praise. I've still got a reason to praise. Amen? How many of us still have a reason to praise? Amen. Amen. We've got a reason to praise. The verse, and I don't know if, yeah, the verse that I wanted to use for this morning, it comes from Psalm 71. It says this, I will hope continually and will yet praise thee more and more. You see, the more that we hope and the more that we praise, the more that God does in our lives, and it's just, a, a, it goes on and on. Does that make sense? And so the more that we hope, the more the hope that God instills in us, and the more we praise him, the more of miracles that he does. I've still got a reason to praise. Amen. So hope. Hope is really hard to define. Because hope is something for in the future. And it's invisible. You can't feel it. You can't measure it. It's a desire or a destination. So I just want to pray before I start. Father, in the name of Jesus, would you anoint your words? Would you give hope to your people? Incre you already have. Increase that hope in us. And God, let us just praise you more and more. And we thank you for Jesus' sake. Just anoint these words. Amen. So hope. You know, hope is as, as different as there are snowflakes. Hope is, is, you know, they say that no two snowflakes are alike. And for every person, that hope in your heart is going to be different. That hope in my heart is going to be different. And that's why I think hope is so hard to define. It's not like I can say, oh, it's this bottle of water. Whoops, this is hope. You know, that's not, that's not the answer. It's not something tangible. And so how do we define hope? It, and I think it goes like this. It's as different as each individual here. And not only is it as, as different as we are, it changes with time, and we have different hopes for different things. So I'd like to use this example. When my kids were, when my boys were in middle school and high school, they used to wrestle. I hated wrestling. How many of you moms like wrestling? Yeah, I don't think anybody does. You have a circle. You put your child that you love with all your heart in this circle, and you're supposed to go and watch them get beat up or beat somebody up, and they're not supposed to get out of the circle. I hated that. And I would go to, and I remember one specific one, and I didn't even do it on purpose. I didn't even realize. But when my kid was in the circle, I would be screaming so loud for my kid that when, it would, when they would come out, when I would leave, I would be hoarse. It was ridiculous. And I remember one person saying to me, excuse me, is that Dr. Clark? <laughs> it was really embarrassing. But I can tell you about a hope that I had at one of these meets. So at one of these meets, my son was in high school, and he was in this meet, and he was going into the ring, and he, as he went into the ring, you could either win by points or you could win by pinning the opponent, and it was better if you pinned your opponent. So we went into the ring, and I was like, oh, I hope so much he pins the guy. Well, within a couple minutes, I realized that's not going to happen. I'm like, God, I just hope that he wins by points. And then I realized, God, please don't let him get pinned. And then as he came up out of the ring and blood was gushing down his face, my hope quickly changed to please don't let him die, God. <laughs> and it was really worked out well because all he had was a broken nose. <laughs> but you see what I'm saying, that our hope changes with different situations. Hope is hard to define. Hope, Hebrews tells us that not only is, is hope, that's hope, but faith and hope sometimes, I think, get confused. Hope comes before faith. The Bible says in Hebrews, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. And let me explain how that looks. Faith, the Bible also tells us in James that faith without works is dead. So when you have a goal or a desire that God put in your heart, you have to have faith. Faith is the pathway to make that happen. Amen? So it goes like this. For example, for, for church this morning, everybody here had somehow had a desire to be in church. That was your hope. That was your goal. That was your destination to come to church. 
But what happens is you could have just laid in bed and said, unless somebody calls me, I'm not going to church. Unless somebody knocks on my door, I'm not going to church. Faith was that you got up, you got dressed, you got in your car, you had to drive to this destination. It took a lot of steps. It didn't just happen by accident. That was faith. That faith is the substance of things hoped for. And then when you got here, you got in the parking lot, you could have stayed in the parking lot and just sat in your car, and you still would not have accomplished your hope, right? But you got out and you came into church. But the minute that you were in church, your hope was no longer a hope because it tells us in Romans, we're saved by hope, but hope that is seen is not hope. For what a man seeth, why did he yet hope for? So the minute that that hope is accomplished, it's no longer hope. Your hope became a reality. Amen? So I think that's why hope is hard to define. Hope is, is two, two different things I think we can look at. I think hope is the object or destination that we're going for, or hope is the process of getting to that destination. As a matter of fact, it, it tells us that that I think that this is critical, and I want us to understand this part. You and I, each of us by name, were the object of Jesus' hope when he was crucified and rose again. Does that make sense? You are Jesus' hope. You are God's hope, the creator of the universe. And Jesus took the steps of faith that we would be in right relationship with him, but now it's up to us to complete that hope. Does that make sense? Somebody put it this way when they were talking about hope. They said that for a fish, with, if, that hope is water for a fish. It's electricity to the light bulb. For a jet plane, it's the air that it flies in. And for us as mankind, without hope, we are, we are just empty shells. And so we have to have hope in order to survive. But what happens with that hope? What happens if you don't have hope? You know, somebody once told me that, and, and I don't think, this is what they said, and I think that if you're not a Christian, it's true. But they said, everybody has some misery in their lives. I said, really? What is that? And they said, well, you know, misery. I said, does that mean you're sad? And they said, no, it's more than sad. I said, well, does it mean things aren't going well? And they said, no, it's more than that. I said, what is it? I said, is it hopelessness? And they said, yes, misery is hopelessness and despair. And without Jesus Christ, that's what we have. You know, it, this isn't a new concept. Solomon, who was the wisest man in the world, said the following. He said in Ecclesiastics, he wrote a book looking at, at mankind and about what was important. And he said this at the beginning. He said, vanity of vanity, saith the preacher, all is vanity. In other words, hopelessness of hopelessness. Everything is hopeless. Unless at the end he came to the conclusion, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. And without that, there is hopelessness. Without God, there is hopelessness. You know, from our scientific communities, the CDC, which means the Center of Disease Control, released a study. The study was released in 2020, and it said that looking at, at people from the age of 18 to 24, those are the prime of age, 18 to 24, one in four had considered suicide. That's ridiculous. Another study out of Princeton University was released, and that study said that from the late 1990s, that the incidence of mortality or death in the United States had increased. But it wasn't increasing because of heart disease or cancer or those things. It was increasing because of suicide, drugs, and irresponsible behaviors. And they, the secular people came up with a reason. And the reason they said, they called it an epidemic of hopelessness. And they called it death from despair. That's how, that's how bad it is if we don't have hope. That's a world without hope. And a world without Jesus Christ and without his principles and his way is a world without hope. Amen? So where does hopelessness come from? And I think that there are two, two ways, and I think that these two, two general categories will describe where all hopelessness can come from. Number one, unfortunately, we live in a society where decades now evolution has been taught. We live in a society where people are agnostic or atheistic. And if you live in a, in a, in a situation where you don't believe in God, 
For you believe that God of Genesis 1-1, the creator of heaven and earth, doesn't really know who you are, doesn't have anything to do with you, you are hopeless. As a matter of fact, you're reduced to nothing more than a chemical manipulation of the genetic code, and you're really no different than an earthworm or a bird or a monkey. That's hopelessness. And unfortunately, I've seen where people look like everything is going great. And as long as everything is going smooth, as long as you don't have any problems, people think that they can be, they're the master of their own fate. And they think that everything is going to be okay. And they live their lives like the rich fool that was in, in, described in the, the book of Luke. He said, I've got all these things and I put everything away. And so now I'm going to eat, drink, and be merry. But what did God say? He said, thou fool, this day thy soul shall be required of thee. Paul himself talks about it in the, the New Testament. He said, if we have no hope of the resurrection, then, we are, then we're hopeless. Then eat, drink, and be merry, because tomorrow we die. You see, without God, there is no hope. That is hopelessness. But what about as Christians? Can Christians feel hopeless? And I think the answer to that is that sometimes situations arise. Sometimes you feel like you got sucker punched. Sometimes, you know, I'm going to use this analogy, and it's a, I don't mean it to be trite, but you'll understand what I'm saying. Especially if it's a busy day and you're going fast and everything's going fine, but you're, you're in a hurry. And I hate it. In those days, when, when I'm walking fast by a door and my lab coat pocket gets stuck on the door and everything falls out. <laughs> You know what I'm saying? But sometimes that's how life feels. Sometimes you're going fine. Everything looks good. And all of a sudden you get a bad report from the doctor. Or maybe a relationship goes stale. Or maybe something financially isn't, isn't happening the way you want it. And you're like, God, where are you? What is that? Now I'm going to tell you, you have a choice in that situation. You can dwell on your problem. You can worry about the problem. And you can postulate your future based on the problem. Or you can look to God, the author and finisher of your faith. And you can magnify God. As a matter of fact, Psalm says, magnify the Lord with me. And whichever one that we do, that's where we're going to go. If we feel like, like, if you look at your problem versus look at your God, who's bigger? Is your problem bigger or is God bigger? And whichever one is bigger is the one you, that you're going to, that that's where your hope is going to come from. Amen? Amen. And, you know, I, I really feel like God laid this on my heart. When we concentrate on our, on our situation over God, we're actually worshiping that situation, and that's wrong. So we can magnify the Lord, and as we magnify the Lord, we, don't, we, we do not have to be hopeless. As Christians, we will never be hopeless. You might feel like, wow, what just happened? But get back into it. Praise, praise. I've still got a reason to praise. Amen? Amen. Amen. So, you know, there was a story that I heard, and, and I think this makes a lot of sense. And the story said this. It said that a man was buying two animals, and he was buying one represented faith and one represented fear. And he said, but which one of these is going to grow? And the, the guy that he bought it from said, whichever one you feed. And that's the way it is. Whichever one we feed is the one that's going to grow. So what about hopelessness? Yes, hopelessness can occur. However, we, that, that we don't have to go there. We don't have to be there. We don't have to ever go there. So if hopelessness is so bad, is it not better to have hope in something? Even is it, Would hope in anything matter? Or can you have a false hope? A false hope is a confidence in something that's not true, that's not really going to come to pass, and that's a false hope. So I want you to, you know, the Bible says some trust in horses, some trust in chariots, but we will remember the name of the Lord our God. We're trusting in God. So false hope, let me just give you an example of false hope. You can have false hope, body, soul, and spirit, and then you be the judge. Is false hope okay? False hope for your body. Detroit 2015. There was a doctor, his name was Dr. Fada, very well-liked doctor, very respected doctor, very busy doctor. He, he did so much good, it looked like. He was a medical oncologist, so he treated patients that had cancer. And people were afraid, and I think sometimes with fear, you can get people to have hope in something because they're afraid. So people were afraid, and people put their hope in Dr. Fada. But the problem was Dr. Fada was telling people they had cancer when they did not. He was treating people that didn't need to be treated. 
And finally, the, the uh, Justice Department caught up with him, and he's now spending 45 years in prison for treating over 500 patients that didn't need to be treated. But those patients put their hope in him. They put their trust in him. And yet, some of they suffered. They, they had to pay money that they did, shouldn't have had to pay, and some died as a result of false hope. That was bad. What about hope for your soul? You know, hope for your soul, it, that's your, your mind and your emotions. We're told in this society that if we will just have an, be, accept everybody, if we'll just accept critical race theory, if we'll just be woke enough, if we'll just be Democrat or we'll just be Republican, both of them promise that we're going to have hope and everything's going to be okay. You know, unfortunately, with that critical race theory, that woke idea, what do we see? In our schools, we see little girls being told they can be little boys, little boys being told they can be little girls, and we see the disaster of that right before our eyes. At the very basis of our identity, our identity is being questioned because people are putting their hope in this idea that if we just be all inclusive, that everything will be okay. It's not. It's crazy. As a matter of fact, we saw on the news not too long ago one of these, these children who they were tr the, the parents didn't even know and the teachers were encouraging them to, to change their gender, to have gender fluid, uh, fluidity, that that child tried to commit suicide. They're confused. This is wrong. This is not okay. Unfortunately, Mike and I, when uh, we've been out the last several times, we've seen bearded men wearing dresses. What is that? What is that? That's confusion and delusion, and it's not okay. You see, a society devoid of God is going to lead to nothing but death and destruction, and that's a false hope. If you think that you're going to be okay based on everybody being all-inclusive, that's a false hope. Another false hope is spiritually. Can you have false hope spiritually? And you all know the answer to that. Jesus himself said that there would be wolves in sheep clothing, that would go about teaching a form of the gospel but denying the power thereof. We have people that they just want to have a, a big congregation or they just want to please people, and they'll teach anything in order for that to happen, and people will follow them, but that's a false hope. And the end thereof truly leads to death and destruction and, unfortunately, eternal destruction. Amen? So we need to have... If you have a false hope, it's worse than, a, than not having any hope because with no hope, you're looking for the answers. But with a false hope, you just don't even, you, you're accept, accept it something that's not true and that you're going along with it. So you don't want to have a false hope. So the answer is, where is the only true hope? And the only true hope comes, it tells us in Acts that there's one name given under heaven whereby we must be saved, and that's Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. And I think that everybody here, we're, we're preaching to the choir that Jesus Christ is the only source of our true hope. Amen. And if you have true hope, the, several things that I just want to state about true hope. True hope, number one, if you have true hope, you're going to have um, a purpose in life. So Psalms 37.4 tells us that if you delight yourself in the Lord, he will give you the desires of your heart. The desires of your heart doesn't just mean anything that you want. It means that God, you're delighting in God, and God is putting those desires in your heart, right? So, so it's not what I want. It's what God wants for me and what God wants me to be doing. That is true hope is that you have a purpose in life if you have true hope. And not only does he give you those desires of your heart, but it says in Proverbs that, that if you will trust in him and acknowledge him, that he's going to direct your paths. So he will not only give you the hope, he will give you the faith steps to make that hope come to reality. So that's huge. If we have Jesus Christ as our Savior, we have a true hope. Number two, that hope gives us the ability to lead others to Christ. And this is huge. So when you are born again, Jesus Christ, his Holy Spirit, comes and lives in you, right? And when he lives in you, he says it this way in the Colossians. He says that Christ in you is the hope of glory to those that don't know Jesus. Christ in you is the hope of glory. You know, Jesus said it this way. He said that, 
that we're the light of the world and that a city set on a hill cannot be hid. We are to be letting that light shine through us. And I would give this analogy. Uh, Mike and I were up at our cottage a few weeks ago, and we were cleaning, and we were washing windows and doing all that stuff. And at night, if you turn the lights on, if the windows are clean, the light's going to shine out. But if the windows are dirty or you pull the shades down, you can't see the light. And some of us as Christians, probably all of us, me, big time, we need to clean our windows and let the light shine. Amen? Amen. We need to let that light of God shine forth from us because it's that light that draws others to Jesus Christ. So that hope is going to lead others to Jesus Christ. That hope is an anchor for our souls. Hebrews tells us that, that the hope is an anchor for our souls. And you know what that means? It means that when all of these things are being taught out in the world, when all of these other things, people are saying, oh, this is okay, and, and if, if we if we dare to say anything against gender fluidity or we dare to do those things that we're, that we're wrong, that we're bad, that, that anchor for our soul tells us what's right. It tells us where the true compass is, and we can know that that's true and we can stick to that. Amen? Hope gives us perseverance. Romans 12, 12 says that, talks about perseverance, but I like this one. It says that the man that plows, plows in hope. You know what that means? It means that the guy that's plowing isn't plowing for the sake of plowing. He's not plowing because he wants to see the dirt all just stirred up. He's plowing for a reason. And you know what? Sometimes when God gives us a hope in our heart and he gives us the faith steps to do to make that hope come to pass, and we do everything that we think we're supposed to do and nothing happens. Have you ever been there? And you're just doing everything that you know, but nothing happens. And I believe it's like this. It's like the farmer. And when, when, or if any of us, if we plant a seed, say I plant an apple seed, I'm expecting an apple tree. I'm not expecting one apple. I want a, a whole harvest. I want 30, 60, 100 fold harvest. We plant a seed. But then if I went every day and I dug that seed up, it would never grow. That seed has to germinate in order to grow. Amen? And sometimes when God puts a hope in our heart and he gives us the steps that we're supposed to follow to make that hope come to pass, if we go constantly and we're worrying and we're digging it up and we're trying another route, guess what? We're, we're causing that to not grow. We have to be patient, and hope gives us the ability to be patient. And this is a part that I think is really important. What do you think the disciples thought when Jesus was buried? Much like the seed, he was in the ground. He looked like he was dead. He looked like their hope looked like it was gone. And then things looked bad. The, things had gone that week. I want you to think from the perspective of the disciples. Here's Jesus. He's 33 years old. He's got everything going for him. He can raise the dead. He can heal the sick. He can multiply the fish and loaves. He controls the weather. He comes in in the triumphal entry, and everything looks great. But now, within a matter of a few days, Everything has gone sour really quick. He's been, the, the crowds have turned on him. He's been arrested. He's been, he's been beaten. He's been mocked, and he's been crucified. And now he's laying dead in a tomb. That didn't look very good. But you know what? I was thinking back, and I was thinking about, what about Gethsemane? When Jesus was in Gethsemane, remember, he's fully man. And he prayed to the Father, and he said, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. But there were two reasons I believe that Jesus was willing to go to the cross. And I believe one, will, one reason was, comes from 1 Peter 3.9. It says, God is not willing or hoping that any will perish, but that all will come to repentance. And so Jesus was willing to take those faith steps because of that. And Hebrews 12.2 says that who for the joy set before him, Jesus was willing to endure the cross. The joy set before him was the hope of what would happen if he followed those faith steps. Amen? But think about it. In Gethsemane, in that night in Gethsemane, here's a man that's fully alive. He's, he's young. He's 33 years old. He's vibrant. And he's, why does he have to die to be alive? He's already alive. He's alive, and he knows he's going to be crucified, and he hopes he'll raise again. He hopes on the hope that he would raise again because he hadn't been raised yet. So it was a hope. But he knew he was God. He knew it was a hope. 
But that hope wasn't the only reason. But it, that doesn't make any sense. He's already alive. He doesn't have to be crucified to be alive. But the hope was you and I. Put your name in there. That hope, that, that joy set before him was each one of us. From the ages, thousands of years ago, Jesus Christ had our name when he was willing to go to the cross. That was the hope. And so those disciples, three days later, when Jesus rose from the dead, and this is awesome, that hope that he would raise again, that hope that Jesus had that he would raise again became reality. Amen? And we live in resurrection reality today. Amen? Amen. We are living in resurrection reality because of the hope that Jesus had, because he followed through on the faith steps. And today is resurrection reality because of what Jesus did for us. And so because he did that, we don't have to be afraid of death. You know, we're eternal creatures. And at some point, each one of us will pass from this life into the next life, whether it be through natural passing or whether it be through the rapture. None of us are going to stay in this world like we are forever. We're eternal creatures. And we have a choice because of resurrection reality to spend eternity with Jesus Christ or to spend eternity separated from him. And that is complete hopelessness. Let me give an, a, just a, a quick story example of the fact that we're eternal creatures. Many of you know that about eight years ago, my brother passed into eternity. And he was, he was my brother. He was my friend. He was a colleague. He was a physician. We had a lot of patients in common. And one day, shortly after uh, he had passed away, I went into a patient's room, and the patient was very rude. And they said, well, we hear your brother died. And I said, what? And they said, we hear your brother died. And I said, no, my brother didn't die. And they said, what? And I said, I'm going to take care of you, and then I'm going to explain. So I took care of whatever their problem was. And then I said, okay, in a minute, I'm going to walk through these doors. And when I do, you're not going to see me anymore. But that doesn't mean I'm not alive. And I said, my brother is very much alive but he's just alive in a different place. Amen? And that's how it is for every one of us. We will never cease to exist. The question is, where will we, cease, where will we exist? Paul said to live is Christ, but to die is gain. And so because of the hope of the cross, we don't have to be afraid. And you know what? That's really basically my message. So if you guys want to come forward, so the, 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 what I would say this morning is if there is anybody here who doesn't know who Jesus Christ is, he's the source of your hope, that these altars are open to just pray and praise God and ask him to be the hope that is in us, the hope of glory, and that we would have eternal life. And if you know Jesus... It's okay. Everybody has to have their hope renewed and refreshed at sometimes. That's okay. And these altars are open to say, yes, God, we praise you. I've still got a reason to praise, and I'm going to hope because I know that you're in control. And I promise you, if you will just persevere, if you will just wait on the Lord, that he will bring to pass that hope that he's put in your heart because he wants it more than you do. So... Let's all stand. Father, in the name of Jesus, if you're here today, you just need your hope renewed. You've been knocked down, you got back up, but you're still feeling a little woozy. For whatever reason there is, or just for the sake of coming around this altar, that we can take a few moments together to get close together and just energize this place with his praise. So I'm gonna welcome people to come to this altar. I want them to sing that song. And let's praise the Lord before we leave. Can we do that?